Good morning, Liberty Orlando, and happy Independence Day. And welcome to Liberty Church of Orlando. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Genesis. We'll be taking our scripture text from chapter 50, verse 20. Today's message actually is one that I preached to our congregation here in Oklahoma last year. But it deals with a very important issue. We're going to deal head on with the subject of slavery. We're going to go in depth to what the Bible has to say about it. Our scripture text comes from Genesis, and of course we're dealing with Joseph after he had been betrayed by his brothers, beaten up, sold into slavery. Actually the first slave trade that we have evidence of in history was Joseph being slow, uh, sold to the Midianites. Uh, we know that the first enslaved race of, that we know of as Christians were in fact the Jews. And Joseph made the observation as he was talking with his brothers who were scared to death after their father Jacob had died. Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God intended and used for good. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is very clear about slavery. We can, in fact, enslave ourselves in debt. And the Bible says if we owe money, we're to pay it off, right, to work it off. However, the Bible is very clear also about stealing a man and enslaving someone, depriving him of his liberty in a wrong fashion. And that, the Bible says, is worthy of the death penalty. Absolutely forbidden. There is nowhere in the Bible where it condones stealing a man's labor. And we need to know these facts so that we can teach them to our children, know them ourselves, and to be able to reprove the lies that are permeating our society. There is an effort right now to try to bring down America. And America is not perfect, but America is exceptional. We've been the greatest, freest, most prosperous country in world history. And there's a reason. When we've gotten it right, we've gotten it very right. When we've gotten it wrong, we usually pay for it, but we generally learn our lessons fairly clearly, fairly quickly, and, and try to correct them. So I hope that you enjoy this message, and I hope that you have a wonderful July 4th celebration, and happy birthday to the United States of America. We will read a text of Scripture from Genesis chapter 50, beginning in verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us, and will certainly requit us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said unto them, why are you afraid? For am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear not, I will nourish your, you and your little ones. And, will be comfor and, and, and he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of of the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, we ask now for your blessings upon our uh, sister church in Orlando that we had the privilege of helping in birth. God bless them with courage. May they always stand up and speak truth to the people and into the culture. And Lord, we ask for your blessings upon our service today. Lord, speak to our hearts transform us. And Lord, use this message in some way to promote truth throughout the United States of America. God, where repentance is needed, may we repent. Where forgiveness is needed, may we forgive. But Lord, may there be unity within the body of Christ so that we can be effective in engaging the culture with the truth of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we see tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands born again as a result of all this, this great fear that's being poured out upon our country. 
Lord, we know that Romans 8, 28 is still in the Bible, and we know that you are still on the throne. Lord, we pray that you'd use all of this which is intended for evil, that you would use it for good. Now, God, bless now my lips as I speak to our people and speak to hopefully more than that across this country by video and, and social media. Lord, may we reflect on the good things of America and also remember the evil. May we repent of that which is evil and hold fast to that which is good as we celebrate our wonderful country's birthday this weekend, this Independence Day. Lord, bless now this service. Be glorified in it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, of course, everyone that's been to church knows about Joseph, the 11th of an eventual 12 sons of the patriarch Jacob, the first and at that time only son of Jacob with his wife Rachel. And he was, of course, dad's favorite. We're all familiar with Joseph's coat of many colors. We don't know all the details surrounding it. It may have been a talith, a prayer shawl with the family uh, colors on it. Whatever it was, his father clearly demonstrated that Joseph was his favorite. By the way, dads, that is not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. You love all of your kids. You know, I've heard it said like this. You know, when you, when you have children, you wonder, can I love the second one as much as I love the first one? Can I love the third one as much as I? Yes, you can. Because you're not dividing one fixed amount of love. It's kind of like taking a candle and lighting other candles. There's more and more and more and more light, but the light from that first candle is not diminished at all. So you love your kids, each and every one of them, uh, unconditionally, and you love them equally. Obviously, Jacob did not. That caused all sorts of problems. Joseph, as he was growing up, had these dreams that God had gave him. One, of course, the, the dream of the 12 sheaves and representing he and his brothers, actually at the time, 11 sheaves, and how the sheave of Joseph stood in the front and the other 10 bowed down before him. Well, his brothers didn't like that at all, as you can imagine. Then Joseph had another dream of, of his father and mother being the, the sun and the moon and his brothers being stars and all bowing down before the star of Joseph. Well, as you can imagine, big brothers did not think much of little brother. And one day the big brothers were out watching the family flocks and herds and Jacob sent his son Joseph to go and tend to them, see them, to send them a message and retrieve them. Then scripture says that when he got there, they wound up beating the daylights out of him throwing him into a pit and had planned on killing them when some of the older brothers intervened and said, no, he's our blood. We cannot kill our brother. Well, what did they wind up doing? Well, there happened to be a Midianite caravan passing by. And verse 28 says, then there passed by Midianite merchantmen and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Of course, you all know Joseph was sold into slavery, first into Potiphar's household, like the secretary of state for the Pharaoh of Egypt. And then, of course, false accusations were made against him. He found himself in prison for several years. While there, he was a great testimony uh, of the Lord. And, and, and then eventually, God miraculously lifted him out of the pit and took him right to the palace. And, of course, Joseph, after interpreting a dream of Pharaoh, wound up being commissioned to be the number two man in all of Egypt. And, of course, led in the preparation for the famine that God had forewarned. Well, as time went on, of course, all of Joseph's family, Jacob and all of his kin, were brought to Egypt and lived in the land of Goshen. And they lived there peacefully with great provision. And then over time, after Joseph died, his brothers were scared to death. They had taken Joseph, or, or Jacob, uh, Jacob the, the father, and buried him back in the promised land. And as they came back to Egypt, they were afraid that at this point, Joseph would seek vengeance upon their lives. And Joseph, as you saw in our text this morning, said this, am I in the place of God? Yeah, I know what you did was evil. I know what you did was intended to be evil towards me. However, God had a bigger vision. God could see on down the road. And what you intended for evil, God used for good and saved many people alive, the Scripture says. Folks, the first slave mentioned in the Bible was Joseph. The first slave race mentioned in the Bible was Israel. 
And for nearly 400 years, the Bible says that they were treated with harsh rigor, but their cries were heard by the Lord, and eventually Israel was freed, and Egypt was hardly pu ha harshly punished by the hand of Almighty God. Well, we know also with extra-biblical sources that slavery has existed worldwide since that time. Slavery is documented in the Code of Hammurabi that's dated to 1860 B.C. It's documented in ancient Samaria and ancient Greece and ancient Rome in historic Africa as tribes would conquer other tribes and enslave those tribesmen. Muslim slave traders. It was uh, held throughout Europe, throughout Asia, throughout South America, and yes, even in North America. But when Senator Kane gets on the floor of the United States Senate and says, The United States didn't inherit slavery from anybody. We created it. It got created by the Virginia General Assembly and the legislatures of other states. It got created by the court systems in colonial America and sense that enforced fugitive slave laws. It was, we created it. He is just another Democrat who is lying to advance his politics. And Senator Kane, please recognize what the Scripture says about those that intentionally deceive and lie. And I beg you and those with you to please heed the warnings. Fall on your face. Trust Christ as Savior and be a speaker of truth. The differences between the attitudes of slavery in the North and in the Southern colonies can best be learned by tracing each to the fundamental roots of its respective culture. By the way, let me pause and add this parenthetical insert. The Bible says clearly that stealing a man is punishable by death. Not one day, not one man is stealing a man acceptable or right, and God never sanctioned it. Now, God did allow servitude. And if you stole from someone, guess what? You didn't go to jail. You worked it off, plus interest. If you uh, uh, defrauded someone in business, you worked it off, plus interest. If you filed bankruptcy, you could not do that because that's stealing from the person that you borrowed money from. You actually worked it off, plus interest. So you could, in fact, enslave yourself. And by the way, we do the same thing. I'm halfway through a 30-year indentured servitude purchasing the house that Cindy and I live in. Most people get into five years of indentured servitude to purchase their cars. We are fa well familiar with financing and working it off and paying it off over time. However, stealing a man is always wrong. And the fact that there was even one slave for one day in American history is a soil and a stain on our history. However, America is not the author or the perfecter of slavery as the liberal press would like you to believe. We have seen already in Scripture the origin of slavery according to the Bible. We've talked about history, the history of slavery worldwide, and we speak as if slavery was something in the past tense today. That is not true. There are estimates of as many as 45 million slaves in the world today. And folks, this is not hard. Everybody's got a Google search engine. You can document and verify all of these things. Historically, African tribes enslaved each other and participated in the slave trade. Historically, Indian tribes in North America enslaved each other and participated in the slave trade. Why don't we hear that in our history classrooms? Or why isn't that taught or promoted amongst the secular press? You know why? Because it doesn't fit the narrative of the hate America first crowd. Again, the differences between the attitude of slavery between the North and the South in America can best be explained by tracing each to its fundamental roots of its respective culture. The Pilgrims and the Puritans of New England were largely church families made up of individual family units. You had husbands, wives, children, young men, young women all coming over on ships first to, to Plymouth and then to Boston and other settlements. They were coming to stay and to build a new life in the new 
world. And as members of these groups, which were outcasts from England, they were the Puritans, they were the pilgrims, they were the separatists, they were the rejects. They didn't follow the traditional Anglican church doctrine. They were not aristocrats. According to the pilgrims and Puritans, all men were equal at the foot of the cross. By the way, they worked with and evangelized the Indians. They didn't steal property from the Indians. Check your history. Look up a great Indian named Habamoth that was the warrior from Massasoit. Habamoth, after about three years, became a Christian. And Habamoth's village was built and stood side by side with Plymouth. And they walked in amongst each other as brothers in Christ, just as we walked down the street. There weren't issues there. As a matter of fact, the longest peace treaty in the history of the United States of America was signed between the Pilgrims and Massasoit. And it lasted for 55 years. Now... The first settlers in the South established Jamestown in 1607. 144 men, no women, no children. Does that sound like they were settling to you? No, they were coming here looking for wealth. They were members of the Anglican Church of England and as such were steeped in society of nobility and gentlemen and class. A gentleman would do no manual labor. He would rather die than betray his class by soiling his hands. So when they landed, they would go and explore and trade with the Indians or raid them these descendants of the aristocrats or wannabe aristocrats because they believed that farming was beneath them. And as they arrived, the gentlemen immediately went searching for, for pearls among the oyster beds while the laborers unloaded the ship. But you see the point I'm trying to make is in the South, the old world aristocracy of sophisticate and the working class was established from the very beginning. So we see the seeds of difference that were planted at the birth of each by society. One group fostering a class of society, the other fostering the ideas of aristocracy and laborer classes. And this contrast is most evident with the first introduction of slaves to both the North and the South. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote in his book entitled The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America from 1638 to 1670, says this, the slave trade in North America commenced with a Dutch ship bringing 20 Africans and 90 women to Virginia in the late August of 1619. Remember the first settlers were all men, so the women came over at later day. But in 1640, a certain Captain Smith attacked an African village and brought some natives to Massachusetts. Well, what happened to him? He was arrested. And those native Africans were sent back home at the colony's expense. W.E.B. Du Bois. Have you ever been taught that? Probably not. Doesn't support the narrative. However, ladies and gentlemen, as sin creeps in little by little, eventually the presence of black slaves was accepted to differing extents in the colonies. It was never greatly popular in the North, always minimal, with the most serving as house servants. But to the greater extent in the South, we know there were much harsher degrees. But according to the BBC, in a report dated 9-3 of 2001, over four centuries of time from 1450 to 1850, there were some 12 million slaves that were taken to the West. Now, of those that were taken to the West, only 4.1% came to North America. 95.9% .9 went to South America into the West Indies. Now, according to this same study, also verified by Encyclopedia Britannica, Muslim traders have exported 18 million Africans into the Middle East beginning as early as 650 A.D. In addition to capturing and enslaving 1.25 million uh, white Europeans and Americans with the Barbary pirates around the, the uh, peripheral coasts of Europe. Why is it that we don't ever hear about those figures? Again, it's all because of the narrative. It's all because, remember, America is the great Satan to the rest of the world these days. It's all about bringing down the freedom that we enjoy in the United States of America. 
Ladies and gentlemen, slavery has existed since the beginning of human history and still exists today. So why is it that we act as if it was only America's sin and then it ended in 1865? As I said a moment ago, there are somewhere between 21 and 45 million slaves in the world today, according to the website In Slavery Now, with Muslim and communist countries topping the list. And five of the top ten nations in the world that still have slavery are all all in the central part of the continent of Africa. Why don't we care about that? Do those black lives matter or not? Well, as we think about the time of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, this was, in fact, a hot debate in the colonies. George Washington, in a letter to Robert Morris, said this, I can only say that there is not a man living who wishes more sincerely than I, than I do to see a plan adopted for the abolition of slavery. Charles Carroll, signer of the Declaration from Maryland, said, Why keep alive the question of slavery? It is admitted by all to be a great evil. Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration from Pennsylvania, said, Domestic slavery is repugnant to the principles of Christianity. It is rebellion against the authority of a common father. It is a practical denial of the extent and efficacy of the death of a common Savior. It is an usurpation of the prerogative of the great sovereign of the universe who has solemnly claimed an exclusive property in the souls of men. Noah Webster, the father of American education, said this, justice and humanity require the end of slavery. Christianity commands it. Let every benevolent pray for the glorious period when the last slave who fights for freedom shall be restored to possession of that inestimable right. John Adams said this, every measure of prudence therefore ought to be assumed for the eventual total extirpation of slavery from the United States. I have, through my whole life, held the practice of slavery in abhorrence. My opinion against slavery has always been known. Never in my life did I own a slave. And Benjamin Franklin served as president of the Pennsylvania Society for promoting the abolition of slavery, declared slavery is an atrocious debasement of human nature. As a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson, in his original draft of the Declaration of Independence, one of the grievances against King George was the fact that the colonies at many times had sought to stop the slave trade and even in some of the colonies to make slavery illegal. But in every time, King George overruled them because he was the dread sovereign over all of his territory. But folks, after the Declaration of Independence in 1776, and after fighting a seven-year war to secure it, Pennsylvania and Massachusetts ended slavery in 1780. Connecticut and Rhode Island ended it in 1784. New Hampshire ended it in 1792. Vermont ended it in 1793. New York ended it in 1799. New Jersey ended it in 1804. Did you know this? Why isn't this being taught? Why aren't any members of the media? Certainly, maybe they don't have Google. Maybe they don't have the Internet. Perhaps it's an honest mistake. I don't think so. Why aren't we taught this? In light of everything that's going on, as the country is burning down around us, why isn't somebody putting out the truth? The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 govern the admission of new states into the Union from the territories then north and west of the Ohio River. It forbids slavery. Thus, the new states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa all prohibited slavery. Slavery was on the way out. And if not for the Democratic Party, check your history. Slavery would have ended 60 years before it did. In fact, it took the first Republican president whose party platform was the cornerstone. Yes, Pastor Fisher was running for governor. His cornerstone was to end the murder of preborn babies in the state of Oklahoma. Hey, the cornerstone of the Republican platform was to end slavery. But Abraham Lincoln eventually made the Emancipation Proclamation. Ladies and gentlemen, many of our founding fathers were hypocritical on this issue. You can't deny the facts. We declared that all men are created equal with unalienable rights from God. Then we refused to identify one section of American citizens as human beings. Well, folks, that was supported and endorsed and kept in place by the Democrat 
Supreme Court, the Dred Scott decision, 1857, they said that blacks are not actually fully human beings and should not be given uh, uh, unalienable rights from God. We look at that and we say, how insane! How wicked! But that's the exact same thing that's happening today with the murder of 2,500 pre-born children every day in the United States of America. We have the Supreme Court that says, that's not a baby. That's not really a human. Well, tell me, what is that? By the way, anybody, we might not have everybody in here that agrees with me. You might be a so-called pro-abortion Christian. Tell me, what is that? Is that a puppy? A kitty cat? What is it? Why is it that when abortionists rip babies apart in the wombs, which is what they do. You have a living, breathing baby, heartbeat, complete system. They rip the baby apart and piece it together on the tray next to them because they cannot leave any parts inside the mother because it can cause her to be very sick. But they piece together an entire baby. You know why? Because it's a baby. And folks, we did pay for our sin of slavery. 620,000 soldiers died in the war between the states. Again, it's always wrong. The Bible calls it sin, and it's a stain on our history. But we cannot ignore it. We cannot change the past. We must remember the good things about America, and we must remember our sins and vow never to repeat them. But as we grieve over our mistakes and we learn from our mistakes, we cannot change the past. But thank God, it only took 74 years from our nation's birth to end slavery in America. We say 74 years, that's too long. Let me ask you, how about Iran today? The Fertile Crescent, the birthplace of civilization. We have slavery documented 3,500, 4,000 years ago. And one of the leading countries of slavery still in the world today is Iran, is Yemen. Look at some of these pictures. Hey, this isn't talking theoretically about some wrong that we did 200 years ago that we can't do anything about. If you want to do something about slavery, we got more slaves in the world today than ever in the 1800s. Why don't we do something about this? Oh, but that doesn't, that doesn't fit the political narrative. That doesn't suit our cause to bring America down. Folks, in America today, we kill 2,500 inconvenient American citizens every day, including an average of 1,876 black babies are killed every day in the United States. But apparently, those black lives don't matter. We refuse to recognize these human beings as human beings, and we legally kill them. Folks, let me tell you this. If the Lord tarries, how will future generations look back on our generations and judge us? It's easy for us to look back at what they did in the year 1600, in the year 1700, and judge them by our current moral standards. How will they in 21, by the way, the millennial generation is strongly pro-life. You know why? Because they've got eyes. They can look at, a, at an ultrasound. They can look at a 4D sonogram. They recognize what we're doing is wrong. It's killing babies. What will historians and what will the activists in the year 2100 think about our generation? I wonder if they'll be uh, uh, outside the halls of, of Congress uh, going in wanting to tear the picture of Nancy Pelosi down off of the wall and burn it because of her devout advocation and support to continue to keep legal the murder of these citizens. And quite frankly, perhaps they'll do the same thing with the portrait of Senator James Lankford, who is a Christian that opposes slavery. Yet why don't these Christian senators 
rally every day, every year like William Wilberforce did and keep beating their hand on the desk until one day this is too done away with. Instead, we're going to change Columbus Day. <laughs> Folks, we're not preaching about this this morning, but we will at some point mention it in the future. Understand that in the 1950s, all this became public. We had folks that went into the circles of communism as uh, moles and found out the strategy. There was a 45-point plan for the overthrow of America. And again, I don't know if you remember, was it Brezhnev? One of the former Russian uh, heads beat his shoe on the desk and said that they were going to take America down without firing a bullet. Khrushchev. They were going to erode us from within. Boy, aren't they doing a wonderful job. But one of their goals was to villainize our founding fathers and take away our heritage. Well, you know who they first targeted? Columbus. They targeted him 20 years ago. Speaking with some of these men in the Senate now, they said, well, only 21 states uh, celebrates Columbus Day. You know what? When I was a kid, we all did. That goes to show you how effective they have been so far. We'll not talk about Columbus Day. We don't have time. But understand that this is not the end. This will not appease anybody. This will just uh, encourage them that they are on their right path of success. Let me address two things very quickly. First of all, the subject of white privilege. What you see up there is my 96-year-old mother and my 94-year-old aunt. They grew up dirt broke in the Great Depression. Outhouses, dirt floors. In fact, when we went in to clean out mom's house, we found that she had cornered the market in hoarding toilet paper. You know why? Because she grew up without any. So she didn't take it for granted. My grandfather, who I never met, was an itinerant farmer. They made a living by moving from state to state and working farms during harvest seasons. My mom, as a four-year-old girl, as a five-year-old girl, as a six-year-old girl, actually picked cotton. Really, to help support her family. My parents got married after World War II. My dad also grew up dirt poor in Cherry Valley, Arkansas. Dad served our country in the United States Navy. Dad had scars internally that he would never talk about, about what he saw in battle. Dad came back permanently um, uh, damaged uh, goods from the war, never talked about how it happened or what happened. Didn't complain, just worked. They got married in 1946. This couple had so much money that their uh, honeymoon dinner was nickel hamburgers at the White Castle Hamburger Bunny. <laughs> Dad went to school at Oklahoma A&M on the GI Bill. They had nothing. They came out of the Great Depression. Everything that they did, they worked hard, they saved money, and they served others their entire lives. Folks, according to the Brookings Institute, if you do three things, you have a 98% chance of not living in poverty and a 75% chance of being firmly in the middle class. Those three things are, one, finish high school. Doesn't care what race you are. Doesn't care whether you're male or female. Doesn't care whether you're tall or short. These three apply to everyone. Finish high school, get a full-time job, wait until age 21 to get married and have children. If you do those three things, chances are you will not live in poverty. I did those three things. Most of you probably did those three things. That's the key. Second thing I want to talk about briefly in passing is this idea of systematic racism. Folks, America was so systematically racist that in 2008, we elected a black president with almost 70 million votes. By the way, I went back and looked at the information yesterday. Roughly 45% of uh, Caucasians voted for Barack Obama. 
Roughly 95% of African Americans voted for Barack Obama. So let me ask you, are people voting based upon policy? As Martin Luther King said, I look forward to a day when a man is judged by the content of his character and not the color of his skin. Were people voting upon policy or because of a preference for a particular race? 45% of Caucasians voted for Barack Obama. That is not systematic racism. In 2012, America re-elected our first black president. Again, that is not a sign of systematic racism. We have had or currently have African Americans serve as attorneys general, secretaries of state, sit on the Supreme Court, and virtually every position of authority that exists. We have a United Negro College Fund. We have Miss Black America. We have Black Entertainment Television. We have the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. We have television shows called Blackish, The Kai, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, I don't know, Queen Sugar, Atlanta, and others. America's most popular sports stars since 1990 are Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, and LeBron James. Currently, 70% of the NFL is African American. 75% of the NBA is African American. Folks, that is not the numbers of a systematically racist country. Do individual racists exist? Absolutely, on both sides. But these are not the marks of a racist nation. Now, understand that Karl Marx, who was the father of communism, boy, you know what? Ideas matter. When Marx died, uh, it was either eight or nine people attended his funeral. However, his book, his research, his work has left a, a lasting legacy a cancer in the society of humanity. But Marx's strategy was to create tension. With Marx, it was the working class versus the one percent. Create um, friction, because out of friction and disagreement and fighting, that creates the environment for revolution and change. David Horowitz, whose parents were full-blown communists. And he grew up as a full-blown communist through his days in college, saw the light, and he is now a devout conservative. Horowitz said this. Now listen, he said, the issue is not the issue. We don't care whether it's Black Lives Matter. We don't care if it's uh, male versus female. We don't care if it's uh, you know, equal pay. We don't, care. we don't care what it is. We just want there to be tension. We want there to be a, a condition that gives the opportunity for revolution. And he said, the issue is not the issue. The issue is the revolution. Now, I'm going to show you a quick video from Patrice Cullors, who is one of the three founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Listen. I think that the criticism is helpful. Um, I also think that it might... Um, I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super uh, well, that, that's first um, on sort of ideological theories. So uh, basically, she just flat out said it. That's what they're out, and she mentions uh, Alicia. That's another founder, one of the two. Of the, so that's two founders, right? That she's she didn't mention the other, uh, but two of them are, admit, are admitting right, right there, like the their ideological foundation, their ideological foundation is Marxism, the trained Marxist. That's exactly what she she just admitted. She just said it. That wasn't a secret. That I mean, I I've long known that, but. For those of you that have been on the fence with this, you heard it from the horse's mouth. So this is why it's not actually even a co-op. So even sometimes I misspeak and I kind of su suggest that. I don't necessarily just say that. But I kind of allude to it, let's say that. But it's not necessarily a co-op when we talk about these like white leftist communists and so forth. It's not a co-op. 
That's what they believe in. So all of you crackheads that have been centering your last two weeks of your life around donating to this organization. You need to understand what you've been funding. You have been funding Marxism. Okay? That's not a, no, it's not a secret. Ladies and gentlemen, if the goal is black lives, then what about Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood's stated goal of exterminating minorities and the consequential killing of 1,876 black babies every now in abortion clinics? If the goal is black lives, then what about the two black teens killed in the Seattle Anarchy Zone? If the goal is black lives, then what about 18 killed and 47 wounded in one weekend alone in the city of Chicago? The whole world stopped to watch George Floyd's unfortunate death and funeral, but what about these tens of thousands of other black lives? The reality is that BLM doesn't care about black lives. The liberal press doesn't care about 47 million slaves in the world today, with at least half of those being in African nations. That doesn't fit the narrative and perpetuate the desire of revolution in the biggest impediment to ushering in the Antichrist global government on the face of the earth, which is a free United States of America. Amen. Folks, America is not perfect. We never have been, we never will be. But America is the best nation in world history. Yeah. Yeah. Don't take my word for it. See, it's so good, you youngsters, you aren't taught any of this anymore. 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. We all thought that communism was done. If you've been born from 1985 or latter, you may have not gotten a good idea of exactly what communism does. But don't just take my word for it. Why is it that in the 90s, family after family would risk their lives trying to escape communist Cuba by floating 90 miles in the open ocean on rickety rafts to come to the United States of America? Why? Because ideas have consequences. We're free here. It's a land of opportunity. All cultures aren't equal. Why is it that you don't have rafts going the other direction from Florida to Cuba? Why is it that in East Berlin they built a wall not to keep people out but to keep its own citizens from escaping? We would call that prison. But young people, you aren't taught that anymore. And by the way, no one's life is better under communism. It doesn't matter what color you are. Why is it that Mexican citizens are trying to sneak across the border into the United States and not the other way around? Freedom. Not all ideas are the same. Not all cultures are as blessed as we are. And again, where on earth does any person of any color or any gender have it better than what they have here in the United States of America? You know, it's a miracle, and we're coming into land right now. I remember talking with my grandfather who, oh well, heavens, granddad was in his early 90s when I performed his funeral, and that was back in about 2002. But when granddad was a boy, he went to school in a uh, wagon. I mean, think about it. In the United States of America, we were operating by horse and buggy in the year 1900. And by 1969, we had men walking on the moon. 
You know what creates that type of discovery? Freedom. If not for America, the world would not have the airplane, the light bulb, condensed milk, frozen food, personal computers, automobiles, microwave ovens, space shuttles, GPS systems, skyscrapers, laser printers, MRI technology, cell phones, Hubble telescopes, and on and on and on. By the way, we also wouldn't have Google or Twitter, so maybe we haven't done everything well. <laughs> if not for America and youngsters, listen to this. Oldsters, remember this. Europe would be 80 years into the reign of the Third Reich. And the Pacific Rim would be ruled by Imperial Japan. At one time, in fact, throughout all history, when two countries went to war and one country whipped the other one, they either killed all the men or enslaved all the men. Only in the United States of America do you attack us. We kick your butt and then we rebuild you and leave you freer and better than what you were before you attacked us. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, America is not perfect. We were not in 1776 and we aren't now. But what Satan has intended for evil God has used for good. Let me ask you this one question. Think about it. Is Jesus really the only way to heaven? Amen. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. Jesus in Gethsemane prayed, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. There was no other way. He went to the cross for the sins of all humanity. We're all descendants of Adam. Now, folks, let me ask you this. If Jesus is the only way, then it is a good thing that the pilgrims came to North America. Is it a good thing that we have so many of our historical African-American culture steeped in the Bible? Yeah. What Satan meant for evil, and it was evil. But God, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. Those who love the Lord who are called according to His purpose. What Satan intended for evil, God has used for good. With that, let me close by saying happy birthday to the United States of America. Every head bowed, if you would. May we have our pianist. We're going to have just a brief invitation. I know that we've learned that just about every week there could be various decisions for one reason or another. Our altars will be open. We'll sing one stanza. And here it is. Folks, if you don't know, it all begins with a relationship with Jesus. All men have sinned. Boy, that's obvious. The Bible tells us exactly that. If we die in our sins, we'll spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Eternal torment. It wasn't created for man. Matthew 25, 41 says it was created for the devil and his angels. But if we die in our sins, we will spend eternity separated from God. But God, the Bible says, demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And whosoever shall humble themselves, fall on their knees, cry out to Jesus, trusting His finished work for our salvation and surrendering to Him as Lord of our lives, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Folks, has there been a point in time in your life where you said, I do, to Jesus? 2,000 years ago, He willingly went to a rugged cross and said, I do for you. Has there been a time where you have said, I do to Him?
If not, I invite you to come this morning as we sing this stanza. Take one of our counselors by the hand. They will discreetly take you into another room, one of our classrooms, spend a few minutes with you in the pages of Scripture, and you can leave here today knowing that Jesus is not just the Lord, but that He's your Lord and Savior. Our altar is also open if you'd like to come and pray for a few minutes. And folks, please, we need to be in prayer for healing of our country. And there is no healing within the Republican Party or no healing within the Democratic Party. There is healing in the unity of the body of Christ. We need all those that call themselves Christians to start acting like it. And then finally, if you'd like to become a part of our congregation, we have counselors down here as well. You can just come, take them by the hand. We're going to roll up our sleeves and go to work and engage the community and hopefully see people come to Christ. That is our threefold call during the invitation. If God is speaking to you in any way. Our, our altars are open. We invite you to come. I'll pray, and then we'll stand and we'll sing. Father, thank you so much for the freedom that we still have to be able to preach truth like this. And Lord, we must recognize that truth always is hated by the darkness. The church has always been fought against. The unsaved has always hated the work of the church. These men and uh, in history that our uh, our books of the Bible are named for were all hated in their times and hated by the people. In fact, Jesus, you were welcomed so well that they crucified you. Why should we be surprised when those of us that wish to boldly speak the truth in love into the culture would in fact be falsely accused, mocked, persecuted, and hated? It's just our time of service. Lord, we pray that we would always be found faithful. We look to you for strength. Lord, we recognize that you have not given us a spirit of fear but of power and love and a sound mind. Lord, I pray that we would be willing to go and that you would work through us and speak through us. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in the end. And Lord, we do know <laughs> that it is written. We are not working for victory. We are working from victory. One of these days, justice will be declared in Zion. And the seed of David, King Jesus, will sit on the throne of his father. And there will actually be righteous government on the planet. Oh, Lord, what a day that will be when we can see you with our own eyes. But, Lord, until then, you have told us to occupy until you come. Lord, may we be men and women of faithfulness and truth. And Lord, give us courage and speak through us boldly. Now, Lord, finish the work today. Speak to the hearts of our people. Decisions that need be made, Lord, I pray that they would be for your glory. We ask this all humbly in Jesus' name. Amen.